Um, hi. Um, we're going to talk to you about uh, how we use Remake Native at SoundCloud. And by we, I mean, I'm Jan. Uh, I'm the guy on the left. I'm the dev talent on Twitter. And this is. I'm Peter. Um, I need to update my Twitter picture. <laughs> um, we work for SoundCloud, and especially in, in one specific team, we work in the Kratos team. That is a team that takes care of all the needs of the people that are creating music, so catering their needs, rather than the listening side of SoundCloud. And um, we built this thing, it's called SoundCloud Pulse, which is another app that we have next to our listeners app that is for creators. It's an app where you can check your stats of your songs, you can uh, message people, you see your notifications and everything, and it's available for iOS and Android but the Android version is not implemented in React Native yet, <laughs> but might. I shouldn't probably say that. I don't, know. Um, I don't know. But yeah, this is what we did, and the talk is about what we learned along the way. One question, who here does not know what React Native stands for at all? Raise your hand. Oh. Okay. Very quick introduction. If you know React, uh, React Native is... Um, a way to build mobile applications with the React framework and it lets you run native apps instead of web apps on your phone. It's pretty much the same thing than React, React on the web, but instead of rendering DOM, you render native views. Uh, that should help you through this talk. We don't really go into technical details that much. Um, and this is how the app looks like. It's like a standard iOS app. You can see like a comment screen uh, you can see your stats. Not too many listens on that track. Still not too many listens on that track. Um, and it looks and behaves like a regular uh, native app. But let's step back a bit and talk a bit about our motivation with this. Um, so when, for our background, so we wanted to have this companion app for creators, and you saw all the uh, features it should have. Uh, the problem is we did not have any mobile developers available in the, in the company at all because we were all busy shipping uh, our subscription product and we could not have any on the site to work on that. And hiring them, as many people might know, is a pain in the ass because everybody needs them and it, yeah, so they can choose it, uh, what they want to do, where they want to work. And so what we did is we outsourced the Android app to a company that we worked with mm -hmm. before, but for iOS, we didn't really have a plan. And we thought, well, maybe we have some front-end devs that don't really have too much to do. They do have tasks, but we can grab them out and like, put them on a, feature, on, like a, on like a journey team and uh, maybe teach them iOS. We tried it out. It's complicated because it uh, turns out it takes too long to get a person productive when they have never done any Objective-C before. And then all of a sudden, they have to build an entire app by themselves with no help because all the other iOS devs are gone. So they're like, ah, damn it. So what should we do? Um, we did have some prior experience with React Native. There was the same situation <coughs> that there were no iOS devs available in our team, in another team. And this team built a prototype with uh, React Native. A prototype is something that we use internally um, for user interaction testing. So we get some users into the office, we show them a prototype app, they tell us what they think, and that's that. And we, we, we understand if they like a product or not. Um, and we started using React Native for that because there are no mobile developers that can build prototypes on the site by shipping this massive new feature. Um, so we started digging into React Native in this team, and we found out that uh, it was really quick to work with, and users didn't see any difference at all for the prototypes. They, they didn't know that this was only made for like this mini with, with JavaScript and was like this React thing rather than Objective-C. And so that's when we thought, let's give it a try and uh, let's build it. And, Cool. Yeah. So uh, this was kind of the motivation why we why we did React Native. 
um, it's not like we chose React Native right when it came out, but it was kind of a necessity. Um, but yeah, we embraced it. So we started with uh, some investigation, right? Um, we set ourselves um, two weeks um, to have kind of a spike sprint. So sprint for us is like two weeks of, of work in one. And spike is basically like, you know, we try something out and after you'll see like if it worked out or not. Um, so yeah, what did we do? So one of the most important things we did in that time was to include a lot of people. Like first of all, uh, your mobile devs, because first you want you can learn a lot from them because they've been developing like mobile apps for a long time, and you want to include them to like not make them afraid because maybe they're like, what? We're like we're using React Native now, and am I gonna get out of a job or something? I guess I don't think iOS developers have, are afraid of not having a job. But, um, Anyway, this was like key to talk to everyone in the company. We also had uh, presented the Spike prototype that we built uh, at our demo. That is something we have internally. We every two weeks you can sign up to like show something you've done. And we talked very openly about about this project, and that's why a lot of people approached us from like testing and mobile devs to like work on us, work with us on it. Um, the other thing we did was like gather lots of questions. We had like a long list of things like. Because React Native also supports doing um, using your native code and interfacing it with JavaScript, a lot of questions were like, well, what should we build in actual native and what should we build in JavaScript? Of course, we wanted to build as much as possible in JavaScript, but we also knew that probably not everything uh, would work. Um, then we asked ourselves, like, how is, how is performance, like for a long list especially, um, how is, uh, is it affecting battery life? Um, how would we build the CI integration? How would we write the acceptance step and so on? And also like more feature oriented things like the, is there a thing for deep linking into the app with React Native? Is there a native share dialogue? Is there a lot of a lot of things? Is there access to the keychain um, on the device? And to answer all these questions with a prototype, in the first week we're focused on just hammering out some screens so that we could like give it to people and they could play with it. And the second week was mostly about diving into these questions and um, it's finding if there's anything um, that doesn't work. Um, the, the sprint went very well. Um, we, at the end of it, basically were satisfied with uh, what we've seen. There was only very few things that made us worried. Um, so we, we just went ahead. Um, in total, it took us um, four months to build the app from like including the two-week spike sprint and including the Christmas break. So it was actually, we estimated it to be about six months. Um, but yeah, React Native really made it so much faster. I mean, even the starting point of the two-week sprint was basically the app looked almost done. Like we had, we had all the screens almost there. So um, it was crazy fast. We worked with, um, we were able to get one mobile developer. We had a new hire. So it was the two of us uh, were before with only done web development <coughs> and um, one um, iOS developer, which is very recommended. I would say like it probably you don't need someone all the time, but it's very very helpful to have someone with a background in iOS um, for general mobile questions. For if you want to write, if you want to interface with uh, actual native code, which is sometimes has to be. And for the two of us, we also had to learn React because React Native was actually, we didn't jump into React Native from React, we jumped into it from Backbone. Um, it's a true story. Our sample.com is uh, by now five years old and it was built when Backbone was really the hottest stuff around. And um, so we needed to um, learn a lot of stuff. Um, React and um, Redux and um, our first uh, pull request to the repo had a lot of like, use this cool tool, Redux action utils, to have less action data ball type. Then, a couple of weeks later, uh, we don't need that. ES6 actually has a nice action type, let's just do that. Um, and a lot of like, oh, unnecessary state check here. And also, um, performance. <laughs> Realize that should component update is a very important function. Um, this is the result, like, this is like the performance output of like, idle time um, before and after implementing like a simple shoot component update in like one of the much used like list items. Um, yeah, so we learned React and React Native at the same time. 
this, the, the fourth thing uh, is, is tests. So as a web, de well, web developer, you'll, um, you do write tests a lot as well, of course. But in case of emergency, it's pretty simple to like, yeah, let's make a health fix release. Um, not so much with mobile apps, but um, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, later. So that was the journey. What have we learned along the way, apart from React? Um, there are some really, really nice things in React Native. Um, one of the things that weren't shipped right right off the bat in React Native, but were added while we were working on it, was really nice animation support. Um, we haven't uh, used it too much. The screens, the, the GIF you see on the right is something that's not in the app yet. We have like an app intro screen, and we're trying to add a couple of animations to it. So it's kind of in development right now. But it's like very, very nice to work with. There is layout animation, which is basically just magic. You like have a state change, and it just animates it magically for you. Um, you have hot reloading, um, which is so like you save your file. Not only does it like restart the app, but it basically reloads exactly <coughs> just the module that changed, and you stay where you are, which is like, perfect for like when you do a lot of style changes and, you, and you're like somewhere deep inside your app. Um, and of course, you feel very at home with, uh, with when it comes to debugging because you just connect your Chrome or other um, debug tool to it, and you just, you know, you set breakpoints, you use debugger, you use console log, um, as you're used to in your browser. And it works really nicely. Um, about libraries, so what I mean with this is kind of how, so first of all, if the one of the questions we had um, for the native, uh, for the native bit, like um, Facebook and Google SDK, um, for signing in, um, access to the keychain, app boy. These are all libraries that kind of live in JavaScript and in, on the native side, and they already all exist. Um, because we we're like wondering if we have to write a lot of native code ourselves. We didn't have to, because as I said, like the, the community is very fast and they, a lot of tools already exist. Um, if they don't, then you can write a so-called native module, which is which you have to write Objective-C right now. Um, but the style of it is very simple. So you write your, if you already have like an, a lot of Objective-C libraries and you're worried you can't use them, you can. You just have to basically write an interface for them so that JavaScript can actually call your Objective-C methods and also get uh, events back. Um, and another thing that's quite, quite handy because it's just JavaScript, all the web libraries that you already have, if they don't like rely on somehow being in the browser, which most uh, don't, then you can easily reuse them as well. So we have a, a library for um, internationalization, which parses out strings and um, automatically sends them to a service. You could just reuse that. We have one where you can like define API endpoints in a nice way. We could also use that. Um, and then kind of how much of your existing infrastructure, if you're already building um, mobile apps, can you reuse? Um, most of it, as it turns out, because it's almost like when you build your app on a CI, then it's very, very similar to a native app. It's just one additional step. You have to compile your JavaScript. Um, if you want to write acceptance tests, and you probably should, um, again, it's very similar to your setup. So if you already had a setup that worked for an iOS app or an Android app, then you can reuse it. Um, as a web developer, it's like funny, like acceptance tests on mobile are very, very slow. And the setup is, um, you can run into interesting situations. So we have a bunch of Mac minis in the office, um, but we also have a private NPM repository that we wanted to access. But because the Macs are in our office and they kind of are, they would be easy to steal, they don't have access to the VPN, not the full one. So we ran into like funny things of how do we actually download anything from NPM on our CI. Eventually, we found we found a solution, but uh, yeah, we can talk about it after. Um, <laughs> talking of funny situations, um, Jan's going to talk about yeah. a couple of React Native projects. <laughs> so uh, we started out when React Native was quite immature, and I mean, it's still quite immature. So if you would start now, it's, it, yeah, it has some problems. For example, the release cycle. Oh, so roughly every two weeks, there's a new release. 
and it's most of the time a breaking release. And what you have to do is update as quickly as possible because if you don't and you wait like, like six weeks, then you have three breaking releases and you have to adapt to those. Um, or maybe it's a nicer strategy to wait actually because they might add something that they remove three weeks later and then four <laughs> weeks after that it's not there anymore and you didn't update but you never know right <laughs> so what you, it's, it's, it's quite complicated to know what's the best strategy for keeping up with like the two-week release cycle um, the one thing is also funny is like all the project files like for your Android IDE or for your iOS IDE they're pretty much owned by uh, the React Native um, team or by the, the, the React Native setup that comes up. So when you upgrade React Native, there's like a step that is like a, a horrible user interface, uh, not be because it's an autonomous model, but because there are no semantics in it. So let's say who here has looked at a project file internals? Like how does an Xcode file look like? Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, maybe you ran into the same into the same problem because when you upgrade React Native, you get a div for a project file, and you somehow have to understand how the semantics of this thing work to uh, get all the new updates to the base project for your project. But there's no way like this like full of cryptic IDs that were added and compiler flags, and you're not sure should I add them because I don't know how to write C code, so maybe I'll just add them and it just works, and then you add them and it doesn't work, and you revert everything. So we went with like never updating the project files and hope that it all works. <laughs> it always works, works, works so far. <laughs> um, but with all these like breaking changes you have, if you use third-party libraries that rely on like internals of React Native, they will break very often as well. And that is kind of a problem. Uh, but most of the people that um, publish these libraries, uh, they're quite open to changes. And we went in a couple of times and changed things there. And it's, it's quite nice. Still a problem, though, if you have like a tight schedule and you cannot, oh, let me spend two days on fixing this third party. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, so when you upgrade, acceptance tests are key. You really need to know if your app or all of the screens are still working because there might be, I don't know, some mini API of React Native that you were using and they changed something in there and you just would never find out if you don't either test all the screens yourself or you have acceptance tests or you use something like Flow that hopefully has like um, the new API updates already internalized, but that never happens. Uh, there's a couple of bugs in React Native. Really? Yes. Um, there's more than a thousand open issues. Some of them are dupes, so I would say 700 open issues. Uh, and one of the problems for like JavaScript people is it's really hard to solve problems in native land because you land in this line, or maybe you attach the, maybe you find out how to attach the debugger in Xcode to run your app in debug mode, and then you end up with a stack trace that is just binary code. You're like, yay! <laughs> I don't know how to fix this. I, I have no idea. And so it's good to have a native developer with you to ask. You know, oh, please tell me. Um, so what you can do when you encounter these problems, very often you can just downgrade React Native. If you're like, oh, update, new version. Oh, no. Oh, we go back. I always do the same way. Just go back. I know, fear of missing out, but it's fine if you have runs. Uh, so for example, we're currently blocked by this bug. I took like four of the issues that are related to this. It's like our RCT image loader is like a Facebook library to, or an interface to a Facebook library that loads images in native land. And you have to use that because when you want to show an image, it's internally using that. And when you have a long list and you scroll through the list quickly and Images load asynchronously and they're already clipped, it crashes. It's like, how can this be? And actually, when you attach the debugger there, you find the part where it crashes, but it's like a weird object to see construct that I still haven't understood, which is kind of like scoped, but also not really scoped. 
and it's on a different thread. So what? Um, so right now, uh, this bug has been in the last three or four releases, and we already upgraded React Native, and there's so many cool things. So we don't really want to downgrade, but if we wanted to release a new version, we had to downgrade now, which is really a pain in the ass to get rid of all the cool shiny features. <sighs> Whatever. They might fix it in 36.1, but maybe Why not. Uh, you know, <laughs> Another problem is memory consumption. We had more issues with it in the beginning. So for example, the notification screen is like an infinite loading list. It has images on it and cool styles. And long lists are not really handled efficiently in React Native. There's like some optimizations that you can have in native land that you cannot have in JavaScript land yet. And so what would happen, we would scroll so the app is like, oh yeah, it's super, super nice, and it's like stuttering more and more, and then it just explodes, and you have like OOM crashes, which are out of memory crashes, which, what is that? How can a device run out of memory? I'm a, I'm a web developer. That really <laughs> never happens. <laughs> I don't know. If it crashes, it's because, I don't know, you use Canvas in a weird way or something. But no. And one thing is, if you know iOS apps, they have like these tab navigations. So you have one screen, you scroll, but you want to see something on the other tab, you tap on it, it change the screens. That's when the garbage collector kicks in. So if you have like a super long list that is hogging up memory and you want to switch screen, it's like, just sits and waits. So yeah, let me collect this garbage <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> and quickly is not really quick. And that was a real problem in the beginning. Uh, but there's remove clip subviews, a magic prop uh, that you can use with overflow hidden to create even more magic, and it results in this. Improved longness memory hogging a lot with a simple change. Oh my god! If we do this, like add this CSS property and this prop to our list view, we have this. Memory consumption reduced by 90%. Amazing. You have to know these mini quirks, and they're kind of hidden in the, uh, in the API. Right now, remove clip subviews, which clips out most of the things that are not on screen, is turned on by default, which is amazing. But there's a new bug in React Native. Um, sometimes, if you have like if you have the navigator and you navigate like a level down or navigate back, these views that you want to navigate to, they are clipped away and uh, they are gone. Yes. If you, they might appear again if you uh, just randomly scroll, but that is not really a solution. So the clipping algorithm has quite some flaws still, uh, which that's one feature that we want to release. We cannot release because we consistently run into this problem. And that's minor issues, like because you would not really have this feature maybe, but if you run into this problem, you either have to understand the clipping algorithm and ship your own, or if you wait, which is what we're doing right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so that's another thing, working in a native environment as a web developer. It's kind of interesting, because it's kind of scary. Like he, he said it before, like Peter said, uh, you release an app, and then it's out there, and if something breaks, you have very few means to, if you run into a bug in production that affects 90% of your users, you cannot just redeploy your web application. Huh, no, uh, you have to go through the re, um, App Store approval process again, which now is only 24 hours, which used to be a couple of days, which used to be a couple of weeks, two months. So luckily we work at SoundCloud, so we have like a point person at, um, at Apple to say, hey, we have a bug, and then they say, yeah, just 24 hours, because you're so nice. <laughs> but 24 hours is not enough, and you have to really switch your mind around this of like, oh shit, if we run into a bug, we cannot run into bugs, we have to test everything. Um, you have to learn a lot of new tools, like Xcode is, uh, yeah, um, I still haven't gotten used to it, and I try not to use it at all, which Xcode is the thing that you 
used to build iOS applications. And even now, iOS developers don't like it, so I can say that I don't like it. Uh, uh, there's like Fabric, which is something like that uh, takes care of like um, bug reports and crashes and everything. And like, oh, what what is this? How do you read these uh, stack traces? And like tools, how Fastlane is like a tool to build your app and send it to the App Store. And you're like ah, this has to do with like you have to add tons of certificates here and there and they have to be distributed to all the machines that want to develop and like, what? I just want to deploy a new app and I can't even build the app on my, what? Ah. Yeah. Uh, one thing as well as crashes are normal. It happens to everyone. Uh, mostly your users will run out of memory or jailbroken phones are really nice because they crash all the time and you're like, oh God, our crash rate is so bad, but no, that's normal. Everybody has these problems. Um, whereas, like when you come from the web world, you're like, oh, what, what, what's happening? Oh, okay, you see the users using like newest Chrome and everything. Like, I don't know what's going on, and they have like a third party uh, like plugin that crashes on your site, whatever. We don't really have good tools for that on the web, but finding out if you know the tools, why it's a jailbroken phone that crashes and you have these high uh, error rates. Is something you really have to wrap your mind around. One thing to the first point, many of you might have heard of Code Push, which is like a tool you can. So the JavaScript part of your application, you can kind of ship it in real time afterwards again if you use like a tool. So let's say there's a bug. I say, oh shit, yeah, of course. Uh, I, it's a typo, and we're not a type language, so I ship an update again. And this doesn't need approval. It's kind of a way around. We don't use it yet. Uh, we might in the future. So for now, we have to be in the scary state. Well, yeah, it just takes 24 hours for a bug to fix. And yeah, that is it for talk. Uh, thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? Or do we do questions afterwards? Questions after afterwards after I don't know or do we do them now? We do them like after, after your okay. talk. If okay. the end of your talk, yeah, a, now this is after the talk. <laughs> yes. But yeah. do we do them? Do we have the second talk first? Or? Okay. No. Okay. Yes. How do you build routing in the uh, Routing is built into the React Native. There's like two ways to do routing in there. Uh, one is called it's a navigation um, component uh, that you can that knows how to uh, natively route screens or imitate the native routing of screens on um, mobile. There's tons of third-party libraries. We use a third-party library by Exponent, which is um, one of the biggest uh, companies next to Facebook working on React Native. Um, and there's something, a new component called Navigation Experimental, which <laughs> if you really want to see your code break all the time, you should use. <laughs> uh, um, which is, so right now it's a very um, imperative way of uh, declaring routes, but uh, navigation experimental is pretty much, it has like a Redux-ish way to pop and push routes on a stack, which is much nicer to work with and everybody should use afterwards, if it's not experimental. Yeah. Are you using Appium or Calabash? Appium or? Uh, we use neither of those. Uh, as Peter said before, we already had a setup in the company which uses Frank, yeah. uh, which is a very... Yeah, it's a little bit weird, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we just took what we had for our existing native app and basically copied the whole setup. So it's just a Jenkins server that is as a tool, it's Frank, you, you built a special version of the app with it, so it's, it can be instrumented, and um, and then so we can run it. Yes. Yeah. I was on. Yeah. Yes. I saw some in Deutsch. Also, I have da was gelesen for the compilation. Mm-hmm. Ich glaube nicht ganz richtig. Es kommt auch an, was man unter compilieren versteht. Uh, es steht da nicht zur Bildzeit ein nativer Code, sondern zur Laufzeit steuert das JavaScript native Objekte über eine Auf Kompilieren. Es bleibt alles im UI-Thread und hat dort 
automatisch gewisse Beschränkungen der Performance. But you could repeat Alex the question in English. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the question was, we uh, mentioned uh, compiling JavaScript on our slides, um, and the, the way we meant it is not that you compile JavaScript to native code, it's you compile the JavaScript itself because it's not ES5, it's like ES6 or ES7 sometimes even. So the only thing that happens is that your JavaScript gets compiled to uh, something that the engine on the iOS device can understand. So it's trans so transpiling more than also that like JavaScript for the last set into the video. This is yeah. special, this is kind of abnormal. And yeah. I would say that this is that is even not like in Xamarin or by uh, native script, that it's actually translated for the video. Yeah, it's not being controlled into native yes. Yeah. Uh, did you run any uh, visually um, problems, like if you have a task or you want to display something like graphs or something, what kind of restrictions do you have to make it? Uh, we, have, we have one view with graphs, so we have the, the stats view um, that has a simple, yeah, a gig we'll get to eventually, um, <laughs> which has um, a simple uh, bar chart. And when you when you hover, you it highlights like the, the current graph. Yeah, it's like it's it's really easy to build like um, interactive uh, charts or visualizations of any kind um, in a descriptive way, in the right way as well. So either by just using views directly, or there's what is the other one called the React Art, React Art, which is kind of like SVG ish. Um, so as far as I can see, it's not a very complex app. And can you say that you're generally happy with what React Native can do? Yeah, definitely. Um, we when we started project originally, there was talk of like maybe if we get more iOS developers later, we'll like and this isn't very good, then we'll scrap it and build it new and like proper native. But we definitely like now that it's out about six months, we can definitely say that we're very happy with it. And we haven't run into anything we can't, we couldn't, we just were like, okay, we can't build this. There, there are very, like, um, there are more visually complex applications, definitely. Yeah. It's just that for our purposes, it would defeat the purpose of like having an overview of everything. But um, there's a couple of really nice blogs that showcase um, more complex applications. It's definitely possible and performant. Okay, so what we do is one build a game. Kind of um, I'm not sure if I would build a game with it. <laughs> that is definitely no, no, a different no. level. No, I, I meant more like I don't know, complex transitions, yeah. um, for very complex animations. <clears throat> for example, on in our uh, listener app, we have the a player that has relatively complex like interactions. You can like drag the waveform and it scales, and there's a lot of transparency and yeah. so on. I think that you could you could definitely build it. I don't know how performant it would be. I think it would be nice. The animations library is amazing, yeah. and so far we, it, it performs very nicely. But we will see because we're, there is stuff we want to build into this, so it will get more and more complex. Um, yeah, so far we haven't run any, into anything that's crazy. I mean, we told you the gotcha, so there's it's not all perfect, but uh, in general we're we're happy with it. Yeah. So for <laughs> just for animations, uh, what kind of library you so you use the native? Uh, uh, there's a there's a library in React Native. It's just uh, it's called Animated. Uh, it's built into React Native, so we just require Animated, and then so first of all, there's layout animation, which is really really nice. If if the animation you plan is basically you have one state of your component, and then you have another state, you can just Tell it to animate this state, and it, it does it automatically. You don't have any. No, no, you can't fine tune the animation much, apart from the duration. Um, but it works very magically. Um, if that is not enough, then you have animated, where you can define um, animated values and then kind of map them to any um, styling values. So you can just animate. So you don't use much CSS no. animated. Uh, no, this is no. like its own yeah. library. Um, the library is built in a way that certain types of animations are actually run on the native UI thread. And so there's no JavaScript code updating or sending events every 
every frame over to animate something. It's, it's and very optimized. Isn't it over to if it's possible to be built with um, CSS animation? Or you don't you don't have CSS you don't animations. Have, yeah, you don't have them. So there is no there is no CSS. I mean, they there is something that looks like CSS, and it's they implemented parts of the CSS spec okay. in a C library, okay. um, but it's basically your CSS is actually a JSON um, that defines things that look very much like CSS, but there is no CSS. And so it's not web environment, not whatsoever, right? If, I mean, yeah, if you know how to style things on the web, you definitely know how to style things there. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the same thing, you just define it as a JSON object rather than a CSS file. There is actually things but the like CSS implementation is uh, not as uh, yeah. So there are not all not all parts yeah. of CSS. Like for example, animations transitions, yeah. and transitions yeah. are not taken from CSS. Okay, but yeah. Okay. yeah. Is that That's a distinction right. between um, uh, animated and animate? That animated actually does up update every frame because it does update actually CSS values yeah. and. Animate hands over to the native stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not, yeah. The, I'm not hundred percent sure. That switch was done a couple of months ago, though. I think in it's animated a, you can still pass use native driver or something yeah. through, and it doesn't work for all kinds of animations yet. But so that's that's all transitioning. But the idea of animated was to abstract that away, and then eventually it will move over to native more and more, and and you don't even notice. Hopefully, stable. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, uh, the React Native uh, way of building apps is that you uh, build some sort of glue glue layer for your platform, and then have the business layer of your app, for example, that written in ECMAScript, for example, right? Mm, not, not sure how you mean that. So it's uh, you're not writing uh, Objective-C code, you're writing ECMAScript. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have some layers, some, some files that connect that ECMAScript to the platform, so to iOS classes, for example. Um, that is, that's only done by React Native. You don't, yeah. you don't do that. Yeah. Okay. That already ex so you exists. Could, you could directly just drop it into an Android project and it would magically yes. cry, create the... It's not project. magic, sadly. <laughs> But uh, yes, like we, we did this, like we, we had the, the same app. There's like certain APIs that are iOS only and Android only okay. because the platforms. So what React Native stands for is not write it once, run it everywhere. It's write it once and use 80% here and the other 80% there and then 20% is platform code. Um, but yeah, when we tried to run this app on Android, we just had to switch out the navigation part and it was already working. Okay. And we didn't need to do much. Understand the Android ID, of course. But, yeah. So, uh, what's your feeling uh, about the future of Spring? And if you already said they're really quick and there are a lot of people involved, um, yeah, what, what's the community feeling? Do you think it's future proof? What do you think? Um, yeah. Uh, let's we look hope. So I think um, it, it has been adopted by many big companies already. There's Airbnb doing a lot of that stuff. There's yeah, we're in Germany, so it's a weird name, but Wix.com uh, is like a massive company that is building, rebuilding their native apps in React Native because iOS apps are too uh, expensive. Yeah. Two scars. Uh, yeah, two scars as well. Yeah, I I think. Uh, it will have a good future, and it's good to see that um, it's not run by Facebook only. It's still that Facebook is driving the development, but there's many other big players um, helping already out. So it's not only. Facebook. So yeah, that's good. yeah, it's good uh, because um, I'm I have a small company, and um, we are inside. We are on the point where we want to decide if we go for like iOS and Android native. Development or, or do the native, uh, the native style also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and also like maybe uh, switch our platform to React, which would be mm -hmm. really awesome to have like React and React Native. Yeah, it would be perfect for us. So. Yeah. Uh, did I got it right? Uh, you told at the beginning that you um, use React Native only for iOS, but not Android. Um, did you say why? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
that's it's uh, it's historical reasons, I would say. So we wanted to start iOS first originally. Then there was the opportunity that we got in touch with a, a, a contractor that was doing Android, and we're like, okay, let's start Android first because we didn't have resources for iOS. So Android got like, in the end, I think six months, no, that's right, three months, I think. I and then it got months. released like three months before iOS, but we didn't want to have like too long a time difference. So then we came up with kind of this solution for iOS mm -hmm. only. So now we're in this situation where, yeah, we use a cross-platform technology to, but only using an iOS. It's historical. We, we did, like as Jan just said, we experimented a little bit how, how hard it would be to port it over to Android. And I, I, it might still be that in the future we decide at some point that, that we'll actually do it. So there's nothing technical that's holding you back? No. Not really. I mean, yeah, we would have to like set some time aside to like br bring it over, invest the 20% that, that are not there yet, plus address some Android-specific issues. Um, but yeah, there's nothing holding us really back now. Um, that's also a very good question. It's 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 spotty that a lot of times it's non Facebook people I see opening pull requests for that. For example, like three D touch. Um, I have seen just like this week a medium post about someone writing um, an app that runs in the messages uh, bit, and that seems to be pretty simple. There's a company that has an app out that is just an iMessage app, and it's built completely with React Native. Um, but there are, sometimes it's not that easy. For example, I think if you want to write a today widget, one of those widgets on the notification screen, I'm not, I haven't read anything, but we haven't dived into it too much. They tend to pick it up, but it's not like day one. Also, native land is not super scary. We might have said it kind of here, but it's, I don't know, they're all normal developers as well, and so, Everybody here is smart enough to understand oh, how do I write a function in Objective-C just to interface with like an API that was introduced now. And then it, it's really not that hard to do it yourself as well. That's what I'm trying to say. On both platforms. Yeah, um, when you were uh, estimating the, the React Native, uh, did, did you um, think in, in the other solution, Native Script? Do you know that? Some, some experience on that? Not at all. Um, we, we just looked at the experience that we had from building internal prototypes with React Native and we knew this would be the tool. And, yeah. Yes, uh, so we, the, yeah, you have to distinguish. Um, it's also another thing when you work with uh, these packages, you have to understand uh, another packager, uh, not only NPM, but then the iOS equivalent. But yeah, we use a lot of native ones. And there's also the hybrid packages that are NPM packages that contain native code on top of JavaScript code. We use a lot of them as well. So, do you want to know which ones? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Facebook SDK itself, which surpri is surprisingly hard to work with coming from Facebook itself. Um, Google. Google SDK, um, a small one to access the keychain on iOS uh, to store like tokens and stuff Super securely. Tokens, yeah. Um, is there much more? Yeah. We, have, we built like small native libraries ourselves to, for example, talk to our own event library to send like events that yeah. source analytics. Like we have our internal analytics that we interface with. Um, I don't have any on the top of my head. In that case, did you wrap one of the packages that they, they made for the consumer-facing apps? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 So we extracted We the, did that ourselves, I think. Yeah. Or was it you know, uh, well, We paired with it. <laughs> understood what was going on. And then we made the commit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool. Thanks. Cool. All right, let's give it up for Young Monster.